and welcome to this session on the ongoing challenge of effective ESG reporting and data disclosure. I'm Margot Chella, Vice President for Research and Anti-Fraud Initiatives at the Center for Data Quality. ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance disclosures, are becoming fairly common practice among companies across all industries, and it's driven mainly by stakeholder pressure. Major investment corporations such as BlackRock and State Street have stressed the importance of ESG information and are making sustainable investment options based on that information. In the 10, first 10 months of 2020, so January through November, we resulted in investments of $288 billion globally in sustainable assets. A company's compliance officers can and should play a critical role in the disclosure process helping to ensure that disclosures are accurate and truthful. Our panel today will be sharing their experience and expertise in the realm of ESG disclosures. We'll discuss how companies can approach the complex world of ESG and provide insights on how gathering and reporting of the information can be managed internally. So let me introduce our great panelists. Kate, let me start with you. Thanks very much, Margo. Um, my name is Kate Brennan. I'm the Deputy General Counsel, Corporate Secretary, and Chief Compliance Officer for Marsh McLennan Companies. Uh, Brian? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Llewellyn. I am Chief Sustainability Officer and Assistant General Counsel for Environment, Health, and Safety Compliance at Schnitzer Steel. Okay, and Mark? Hi, everybody. Mark Siegel. I'm a partner at Ernst & Young, I'm focusing on corporate reporting, and I'm also a board member at the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, SASB. Great, thank you. So, as I mentioned, ESG is top of mind for many companies today, yet there isn't necessarily a single point of focus. The companies often direct their efforts on different components of ESG. So, before we dive into the discussion, let's level set with our audience on, on what some of this means. Mark, could you talk about some of the leading ESG frameworks, the standards, and, and how the ranking and rating system works? Sure, I can give it a start. Um, as you mentioned, there's no one point of, 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 of agreement on where everybody should be um, on this. The one good thing about it not being mandatory disclosure is, is that there's no um, you know, a prescribed way that you have to do it. The bad news about it is that there has um, come up as an alphabet soup of different organizations that have come to sort of fill that void. So there are, I, I like to sort of group them into standard setters, uh, or frameworks, or those who are data aggregators, and then there's rating agencies. Um, standard setters, such as GRI uh, or, or SASB, um, try to put out information that companies can use for voluntary disclosure of specific um, uh, sustainability metrics and um, disclosures. Um, frameworks are things that are put out by uh, international organizations that give sort of high level support of what you might be able to do that might be like the, the UN Sustainability Development Goals, which are 17 goals, uh, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, or the um, International Integrated Reporting Council. Those are all sort of frameworks that give sort of high level guidance um, and, and maybe sort of fewer specific disclosures. Data aggregators, just like in financial reporting, there's like Bloomberg uh, terminals and, and things like that, where there are people who are compiling information that A, you either disclose or B, is out there on the internet. So that exists for sustainability uh, as well. And then rating agencies, which are uh, organizations which might give you a, a score or a ranking based on things that you do disclose or things that are out there in the um, in the ethernet uh, a, a, about your company. And, and I like to call those sort of a quick score, if you will. Um, but um, you know, some investors and frankly, some customers and others use those ratings and rankings as well. That's, that's a great introduction. Uh, we will be answering questions through the chat box feature during this session, so, so please go ahead and get engaged with us on this important topic. So let's move on to the current state and what companies are doing with ESG reporting and disclosure. Kate, I'm going to start with you. How is Marsh McLennan approaching its ESG reporting? I would say that it's been an evolution at Marsh McLennan. Um, we, we started as, as Mark was referring to the alphabet soup, you know, we started reporting carbon emissions under the GRI, the, the, um, global reporting initiative, uh, all the way back to 2010. 
And uh, last year, our our company made the decision and our CEO announced that we would be reporting under the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures or TCFD. Um, and as we got into looking at what that report would look like and looking at the report that we had, um, which we had called our citizenship report, which was the GRI reporting mixed with a little bit of social uh, elements, uh, we decided that it would make sense to integrate all of those elements. So what was before an environmental report um, and a social report, and of course our proxy statement um, as our governance report, we've decided to pull all of the elements together into an integrated report. And um, it's been a challenge, I have to say. We, we were challenged by our executive committee to be in the vanguard of ESG reporting. And so we said, what does that mean? There's no commonly accepted framework. So what we did is we took all of those things. We took the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We took the TCFD framework. We took the SASB recommendations. We took GRI. And we listed out every disclosure item that all of those frameworks and standards would want to see. And um, we used that as our initial outline. And we, we paired back from there, it's voluntary today. So we said there's some things that we're not quite ready to report. There's some things we didn't think were necessarily relevant to the stakeholders who will be looking at this report. But that's where we started. We started with that massive outline. We've paired it back. And we actually on March 31st just published our first integrated ESG report. And what we did is in the back, we included an index to cross-reference all three of those um, for GRI, SASB, and TCFD, so that anyone who is following any of those specific frameworks can then see where we've reported. Um, and we can kind of hold ourselves accountable to those standards. It is an evolution though, and I think over time, there may be a unified model, but um, we, we will be enhancing and we'll be adding disclosure to that. Uh, one thing we said when we put in our first disclosure is once you report it, you can't go back. And so we wanted to make sure that we um, were committed to putting out uh, the disclosure that, that was in that first report on an ongoing basis going forward. Well, that, that's a great example of a very methodological approach to ESG reporting. Brian, can, can you share what your company's approach is and you know, from your perspective as the CSA, what, what factors should companies consider or prioritize? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think to echo Kate's comments, it is, it's always evolving. There are so many different ESG disclosing disclosure mechanisms, and it's it's picking the right ones to, to get your message across and be as transparent as you can. So we at Schnitzer you know, given that there's so many different types of mechanisms that we can report to and disclose uh, about, um, we try to use a three-factor analysis in deciding which frameworks or questionnaires that we answer in our disclosures. And, and it's really around purpose, audience, and scope. So first, we, we kind of think from a purpose perspective, why are we disclosing? Why are we using this vehicle to, to get our message out? And some sometimes, you know, with certain frameworks or for certain disclosures, it's really to educate and inform our external stakeholders. Right? It's really a, a more of a data-driven disclosure, a lot of numbers uh, for investors to look at. The other type is more of, are we disclosing to incentivize our own company to do better, uh, to really try to embed and improve sustainable practices within our company? So for example, with CDP, right? So the CDP gives you a grade on climate or water security or supplier engagement. And so I try to use that grade, that feedback that we get to, to continually improve either you know, with, with, our, with our water uh, security grade, we, we made the A-list. So we, we made it to the top. So now it's really about sustaining that gain. So always going back within our business to say, here's, here's the feedback we're getting and here's what we need to do to get better. So really trying to understand the purpose behind why we're disclosing really helps us uh, in the disclosure process. And I think the second one is the audience, right? So there's, there's certain, certain disclosures that are really investor driven, you know, using the GRI framework or, or SASB where the, the investors can, can go and get the data they need to make their determinations on our company. Whereas in our sustainability report, that's, that may be a, a different audience and we need to tailor our answers in a way uh, our narrative in a way that engages our employees, shows them how their value in the ESG reporting process and becoming a sustainable company. And then finally is the scope. We wanna make sure that we're covering 
all ESNG, not just environmental, right? So like back to the CDP with the climate change questionnaire, that's really environmentally driven. So we want to make sure we, we report to that, but we also report, you know, using the frameworks of SASB and GRI because we want to have that holistic viewpoint of our business with the ESNG. So using those three factors, we're able to kind of pick and choose which which vehicles we use to disclose. Great. And and do you in your disclosure announce which ones you're you're using? We do. Okay. Yeah, we do. Okay. So I want to dig a little bit deeper into the roles and responsibilities with ESG reporting. Um, it cuts across so many different divisions, departments, but but who owns the ESG reporting? Mark, I'm going to turn to you. Who who sets up the controls? How it's, how does this work? Yeah, um, my experience is that it's really been all over the place. Um, I think you know, Kate said it earlier. It's evolving, and 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 it really is. Um, I've seen everything from finance owning it, which is pretty rare, to um, legal, to communications, to investor relations, um, to a sustainability uh, person reporting directly to the CEO. I've, I've really seen it everywhere, and there's no one natural place for it to fit. Anything can work um, um, because, as you said, Margot, it, it really transcends and crosses over um, tons of different barriers. So if you just think about um, the different things that you might be reporting, uh, environmental, social, um, human capital, um, you know, obviously just even talking about those, you think about all the different departments that might be involved in all that. So, so having one owner um, is, is really less relevant to the idea that who, regardless of whomever owns it or whichever function owns it, um, leading practices really are to be able to break down the walls and silos between all the different functions so that you're actually able to capture the, the data and the information and the richness of everything that the company is doing across those different functions. So, so if, if legal owns it, that's great, um, but you need to have a cross-functional disclosure committee uh, or ESG committee where you're getting at the, the information that might reside in the HR system. Um, or you might have to go down to the business unit to get at the information that's talking about wastewater or um, environmental exposure or greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and you uh, also would likely have to go down into the business to understand what's going on in your supply chain to make sure that everything that is, that is um, you know, being done down at the uh, supply chain area and by your suppliers um, that there's, you know, that there's responsible supply chain management going on down there uh, as, as well. Um, and, and so I've seen it everywhere in terms of who, who owns it or where the chief sustainability officer might reside in which function, but really the message is cross-functional team to make sure that you're getting at it um, in a way such that you're able to, to get at the riches of everything that the company's doing. So, so Kate, where does ESG reporting sit at Marsh McLennan? Sure. Well, I think Mark is absolutely right. It is a it is a multidisciplinary uh, report, and it requires help from all over the organization. You know, in our report, we took I think a somewhat unique position that we were going to talk about the ESG um, uh, work of Marsh and McLennan internally, but we were also going to augment that by talking about some of the work that we're doing for clients in those areas. So we pulled together a management ESG committee that has representation from all of those functions that Mark talked about from real estate procurement, travel, um, HR, or our people function, um, and, and all, of, all of those areas. But in addition, we augmented it with senior members from each of our businesses. So we have a senior business person from every business sitting on our management ESG committee too. And that's how we were able to really pull together the full um, heft of the company to put behind this report. But when it came down to actually overseeing the report, um, you know, I, I wear three separate hats that are all relevant to ESG. I'm the deputy general counsel, and so I oversee SEC reporting. I'm the corporate secretary, and so I oversee the governance for it, and also the chief compliance officer. And I think, as you mentioned, Margot, earlier, the compliance function has a strong role to play in, in talking about and identifying how ESG fits into this, the culture and the purpose of the company. Um, and so ultimately I decided to situate the ESG team within my SEC reporting team. And the reason for that is really um, just, you know, my, my little crystal ball that we are all getting uh, access to these days, which says this is going to be mandatory um, in some way, in some shape, 
going forward. And I'd rather have the rigor around it today um, than try to kind of piece together an, an audit trail from prior reports um, when, it, when it inevitably does become mandatory. So today the ESG reporting team is sitting within my securities disclosure team. Wow, very good. Brian, I'm gonna turn to you, um, considering that ESG touches on all these different departments, who else should be at the table? Um, and, and how critical is it, it sounds, given what Kate and Mark said, fairly critical, that it be a cross-functional collaboration? Oh, for, for sure. Yeah, I think I think sustainability kind of sits at the middle of a lot of different functions within the company, right? So the, the, stat, the strategy that we take is sort of this all of the above, right? Everybody needs a seat at the table because sustainability just weaves within the fabric of a lot of different functions. So having legal and compliance, to Kate's point, to Kate's point, and, and finance, operations, you know, communications, uh, investor relations and HR or the people function, they all play a part in our sustainable performance. And I think having, having them at the table has two different functions that are important. One is you've got the right people at the table to get the data you need to report out, right? And making sure that it's verifiable and it's accurate. So having the right people at the table to ensure that we have accurate disclosures is super important. But I think more importantly, having those people at the table when we get the feedback from the different rating agencies or from external stakeholders on, on, on gaps we may have in, in our performance or in our disclosures. So then being having the opportunity to have a conduit to share that information with, for example, HR. If, if we have a gap in uh, diversity and inclusion or pay equity or, or something around gender equity, then we already have HR at the table. They know what we've disclosed. We give them the feedback and then we can go and try to improve our processes to be able to report in the next cycle on the things we've done based on that feedback. So I think it's really important to have the right people at the table to ensure accurate disclosures, but then also to drive improved performance year over year based on the feedback. So when it, when it comes to reporting and data disclosure, it, it seems the information can be contained in myriad resources, many companies, issue multiple reports or they post the information somewhere on their website. Um, I know that my colleagues at the CAQ have uh, gone down the road of trying to look at all the ESG reports for the S&P 500. And the challenge they're facing is you don't, there isn't just one place to go to. Um, even if there is what looks like a, a report for some portions, so maybe the climate disclosure, some of the social and governance things may be uh, things that you have to find elsewhere, and some are qualitative and some are quantitative. Um, but Mark, I'm going to ask you, considering the multitude of data sources and, and the need for collaboration across the different teams, how do companies balance authenticity telling their story while efficiently and accurately disclosing their data? Because a lot of the reason they want to disclose the data is to, to tell the investors and their stakeholders something that the company is doing that, that they're interested in hearing about. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it is anytime you have a cross functional um, endeavor like this, it is very hard to figure out how to um, how to make sure that it's all sort of tying together. Um, and, and so it is hard to balance. And I think this is another area where this is um, this will continue to get better over time. And it is also um, maturing uh, each and every year. Um, having controls is important. And I think that'll be something that we could talk about in a little bit, maybe, um, and making sure that you've got some good information and, and quality to understand the information. Um, but in terms of, of, of telling the story across different communication channels, um, you know, I want to pick up on something that Brian said earlier. Um, you know, understand your audience. It's fine to have all these different communication channels because you are trying to communicate to a whole bunch of different audiences. And so you don't necessarily have to duplicate the story um, from, from one location to the next location. However, when you think about your website versus your investor decks versus your um, SEC filings, um, which could be a 10K or a proxy statement, as Kate mentioned, um, you know, versus your sustainability report, um, there are a myriad of different places that this information exists. And while they don't have to be um, duplicative stories, I'm consistently surprised by 
how disconnected those stories might be across those different um, communication channels. And so making sure how you are um, communicating the story in various places in your, in your um, ecosystem is aligned um, so that your stakeholders don't get a completely different narrative if they're reading uh, the sustainability report from what they see in the investor deck or what they see in the footnotes to the 10K. Um, that's a really important goal um, because you have to understand that investors are, 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 are digesting all this information that you're putting out there as well as information that you're not even putting out there such as Glassdoor and other things like that. And so making sure that at least if you're talking about diversity and inclusion, in your sustainability report and or on your, you know, you should also probably make sure that your human capital disclosures, which are now required in your 10K, um, are at least aligned in themes um, with what you report in your, um, you know, with, with what you put in your sustainability report. And then anything that you might have in an online presence on social media is also aligned at least thematically, if not in detail. Um, you know, so, so I think that that's an important and maturing area that companies need to understand. And you could see how easy that could happen because, you know, these different communication channels are owned by different parts of the organization. And that's why breaking down these walls and, and having that cross-functional team exist is, is, is really important. Yeah, I agree. So that's a great segue to the importance of, of governance. So how can corporate boards and committees provide oversight on ESG? And just as importantly, which committees of the board um, are involved? Kate, I think I'll, I'll turn to you first. Sure. Um, and I, I don't want to shamelessly plug our ESG report, but actually, we, we struggled with this a little bit in, in, in setting it up. We Our board a long time in 2008 kind of recognized the need to have a committee that was really focused on these issues. And so we had a corporate responsibility committee that was responsible for overseeing sustainability, diversity and inclusion, government affairs, um, but not the full gamut of ESG topics. Uh, so, th so that committee has been in existence and coexisting with our other committees since 2008. And in our ESG report, it's page 43 for anyone who wants to look at it, but we really, we, we take each committee and we show the specific areas of ESG oversight responsibility that they have. So everything from our audit committee having responsibility for ethics and compliance and culture and ERM to the comp committee, um, really looking at the design of incentive comp plans, um, diversity and inclusion, pay equity, the directors and governance committee, of course, looking at board composition, shareholder rights, corporate governance guidelines, um, so all, all of those committees have varying pieces of oversight responsibility for ESG. So last year, we renamed our corporate responsibility, the ESG committee. We updated its charter to say that it had primary responsibility for specific areas and that they would work together with the directors and governance committee on other areas, the comp committee on specific areas, um, and so on. And this year, when we decided to publish our first integrated report, we took it through what I would call an SEC report process. It's not yet an SEC document, but it is an investor facing document. So we had our internal disclosure committee, um, which would typically review SEC filings. We had that committee review the, the ESG report. And then we took it to the board and every committee got a pre-read memo highlighting the specific areas of the report that touched on their areas of responsibility and we gave them the opportunity to review and comment on it there with the ESG committee being the the main committee that took responsibility and dedicated its entire March meeting to, to making sure that the disclosures were presented in a way that we we wanted them to be. Great. Mark any, anything to add to that? Yeah a couple things I mean I think as Kate said it's it's um it changes. It's not like there's one, uh, just like it's, it, it's not like there's one preferred approach with how management deals with it. There's not one preferred approach with how the board deals with it either. I will say that um, it's not a bad thing to think about in your proxy statement as to how you're thinking about your board's um, organization uh, around ESG and your governance over ESG. In your proxy statement is a good place to disclose that, um, as well as in your sustainability report or instead of. Um, the NACD, National Association of Corporate Directors, has a really nice 
document on, on how to integrate ESG into your proxy statement that talks about these kinds of things. Um, but yeah, we're seeing how boards are um, uh, thinking about ESG evolving um, from, as, as Kate mentioned, a, a committee that's specifically dedicated to ESG. That is one way to do it. Um, we're also seeing um, boards evolving to potentially have, and I'm not saying this is an evolution, but I'm saying other boards have, are doing it this way, where they have um, the NomGov committee um, having having a role in it mm -hmm. around governance, um, yeah. and and uh, the Comp committee having a role around uh, compensation and whether it includes ESG initiatives or not. The Audit committee is getting more involved in some places to think about reporting and some of the things Kate mentioned about processes. Do you put it through an SEC reporting type of um, process or, or, or not, or at least getting involved to start thinking about what we're already doing. Um, and, and so, so these are, these are all things that are, that are, that are fair game for boards to be thinking about and, and frankly, fair game to be thinking about disclosing. Um, and, and once you have sort of a good handle on what you're doing to actually be putting it in charters and, and disclosing that as well. Yeah. Uh, so I will mention to our audience, if you visit the CAQ's hub on the event platform, um, we have uh, put up some of our latest resources for boards and investors on ESG. One is the role of auditors in the company prepared ESG information, present and future. Uh, there's another one that takes a deeper dive on assurance around some of the ESG uh, reports. And uh, there's a roadmap, an attestation roadmap that the CAQ and the AICPA put together on ESG reporting. And while that resource is primarily written for audit practitioners, there's really good information throughout the document on, on how you might think about where ESG information is reported. And in the back, there's an appendix that describes some key actions that can be taken to establish effective governance over ESG reporting. I think we'll move on to talking about effective ESG reporting and data disclosures. Uh, Brian and Kate, how can companies approach the management of their disclosures in the current environment to meet the expectations of the various stakeholders? What, what have been some of the challenges that you've had to overcome? And Brian, I think I'll start with you. Sure, yeah, I, th I think um, the ESG disclosure expectations that uh, I'm sure the audience will will empathize uh, is, is always growing, right? It's, 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 it continues to evolve and always wanting more information uh, and becoming more transparent. So I think the challenge you know, that I, I fa I'm faced with from time to time is sometimes I'll hear the question of, you know, when is it going to be enough? You know, when, when, is, it, when is it going to stop? And, and unfortunately, I don't think we've uh, reached terminal velocity yet on the expectations from the from our external stakeholders and investors and so forth. And so the challenge that I think I'm faced with is trying to balance between being transparent and meeting expectations externally, but then also being able to foresee or understand the ripple effects of these new disclosures and, and prepare for those types of things and make sure that the, the right people are involved in the decision-making when we disclose these things. Uh, so for example, you know, Kate was talking about the TCFDs and you know, that's, that's something that we are evaluating right now in, in reporting to, to those uh, disclosure standards. And you know, one of the things that the TCFDs are asking us to do or, or companies to do is to quantify climate change risks, you know, put dollar figures behind you know, future, you know, short-term, medium-term, and long-term risks. And when you go down that path and try to be just, you know, transparent in sharing that information, does that trigger some SEC obligations in terms of disclosure in your 10Ks and your proxies? Um, do we have to set environmental reserves for those risks? So we're, it's really trying to strike that balance between being transparent and meeting expectations but then having the right people at the table to make decisions on how do we how do we mitigate the the ripple effects of those things? So it is a, it's an evolving struggle, but that's that's one of the challenges I'm I'm faced with. Yeah, I completely agree with Bri with what Brian has said. It's um, you know you refer Brian to the ripple effect. We kind of sometimes say the slippery slope. Um, if you're gonna if you're gonna start focusing on one area, what comes next? Um, I would say maybe just adding to that a little bit. 
right now it's a voluntary period. It's a voluntary reporting regime. So we have an opportunity to use this time. I, I mentioned earlier when we created our outline from all of the different standard setters, um, there were some things we chose not to disclose. And you know that we're using this as an opportunity to drive internal change saying, okay, we're not gonna report on these three issues this year. We were going to report on them next year. So what do we need to do internally to get our house in order or to get, get our story straight or to have our action plan correct. We're not afraid of reporting metrics that don't necessarily shed us shed the best light on Marsh McLennan, but if we are going to put out a number, we want we need a plan behind it. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're using this period between a voluntary reporting regime and a mandatory reporting regime to really kind of help drive change internally and put ourselves in a position that when these disclosures are mandatory or some of them may become mandatory, um, we're in a position uh, to tell the story that we want to tell behind them. So, so I would just, I, I would probably add that. And then, you know, again, to Brian's point, materiality is important and knowing your audience, you know, as just not to pick on SASB, Mark, but SASB says, how many data incidents have you had? And if, if we, if we say a data incident is one person emailing a document to their Gmail account, that's a whole lot of numbers um, that aren't necessarily don't tell a, a meaningful story to, to any investor. And so, you know, really taking stock of where that materiality threshold is and what's actually material and important to the audience you're trying to reach. And I think you also mentioned, Kate, um, there's the like not getting, trying to get ready to report a number for next year or the year after. But I think the other point that you're trying to make is you don't want to put out a number that you either, the following year don't want to include or it makes it look like you um, you know, had a little bit of a setback in where, in the progress you were making. Totally. I mean, we decided this year to enhance our disclosure around diversity representation and um, diversity turnover data. And so voluntary turnover by specific um, race and gender categories. And that's a number we chose to disclose. And if that um, were to, uh, you know, if we, if that, if those numbers were to uh, develop adversely, we're going to put it out next year too. And we just have to be cognizant of that. And that goes back to Brian, Brian's point, which is you have to have the right decision makers at the table, uh, locking arms and saying, this is something we're going to disclose today and we're going to disclose it going forward. Yeah. And I, I know several of you have mentioned, um, you know, the challenge with ESG reporting is this, this alphabet soup of not having one standard or, or framework to follow. Um, and you know, companies can, can pick and choose as, as uh, you know, Kate, you guys have done. Um, but we're seeing some coalescing around the, the five frameworks, the GRI, SASB, TCFB, CDP, and IR, that's the alphabet soup. Um, and standard setters such as the IFRS Foundation trustees are considering the establishment of a sustainability standard board. How do we make sure that the information companies choose to disclose is comparable from company to company and that it's reliable given all these different frameworks and standards? Yeah, um, that's not an easy thing. There are no easy questions today, Margo. Um, Sorry. <laughs> the, you know, um, navigating the frameworks is, is, is an exercise in, in understanding your audience uh, first and foremost, and then um, also understanding your materiality. Um, I, I think the first thing is, uh, they, they are for different audiences. The GRI is, is for a broad stakeholder audience that includes investors, but also includes other stakeholders like um, your employees, regulators, um, suppliers, customers, and, and really runs the gamut. And, and SASB um, and TCFD are more focused on an investor audience. Um, what's going to be most likely to be relevant to somebody making a capital decision, and and that those are those are mechanisms. Um, by the way, neither one is right or wrong, but but um, you know, depending on what your audience you're you're dedicated time to or prioritizing, that might lead you down a different path to navigating the voluntary frameworks. Um, you know, so I think that's important. I think then understanding which of the recommended disclosures within each of uh, GRI and SASB and TCFD are, are, are uh, material in your facts and circumstances or more important in your facts and circumstances to tell your story. But the frameworks themselves are, are 
are designed to help you with comparability um, across time and, and between other companies in your sector. That's what they are for. The front parts of many sustainability reports are, 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 are free for companies to tell their own literally free form story. Mm -hmm. um, and then they, one of the reasons that, that companies um, volunteer to include SASB and TCFD or GRI is to provide some level of comparability and consistency across time. Um, also getting some level of, of assurance, even if it's limited, will be uh, helpful over time. Again, none of that is required today, um, but that would be helpful in providing confidence uh, internally and to your board and to external stakeholders um, that, that the, the information is consistently defined and consistently being captured um, and is more comparable uh, um, from, from one company to the next or at least over time periods. Yeah, yeah. so you mentioned assurance, limited or otherwise. What are the different types of assurance that one could get? So, just like in financial reporting, there's different levels of assurance. You could do it agreed upon procedures where you're just doing, um, say, greenhouse gas emissions. And we're just specifying these are the things that we're going to provide assurance on. Um, you could do uh, a negative assurance kind of thing, which is uh, which is called a review in, in uh, auditing language. And, and that is when you provide uh, limited assurance or negative assurance where you say nothing came to our attention that makes us believe this is, um, you know, this is out of compliance with with a particular framework. Um, that is kind of where the market is going, those two areas. Um, out there at the edge uh, is, is an examination, which is like a full audit. And it's pretty rarely done where you see a full audit, a full examination of, of this information, at least as of now. Um, one of the things that um, is being thought about uh, both in the US and around the world is, does assurance need to be, you know, in the same way as what content might be required over time, does assurance need to be required over time is another question that's out there. So Brian, I'm going to ask you, have you all sought assurance over any of your ESG metrics and reports? Yeah, we have. So a lot of our ESG disclosure data comes straight from our annual sustainability report. So we have two different functions that provide assurance. So we have an internal audit team, a group of individuals that actually go line by line on the entire sustainability report, checking and verifying everything that we're saying in the report. And sometimes that can be very painstaking. <laughs> it, it, it takes usually around three to four weeks just to get through our own internal IA group. And they and, and I think we've touched upon this before, they, they treat it kind of like an SEC disclosure. And so we have to show all the background supporting data for each of the statements that we make and the, the data that we share. And then once it makes it through IA, our own internal independent team, we all of our environmental KPIs, so all of our water usage, energy use, greenhouse gas emissions, and you know, landfill, you know, waste to landfill, all the all that data goes to True Cost, uh, which is owned by you know I think S and P Global now bought them out, but they do a level two assurance on all of those KPIs as well, just to get that third party verification. That, that in fact our, our data is accurate. So we kind of have two different levels of, of assurance. Yeah. So th there is an increased scrutiny in, in how companies are measuring their actions and greater pressure for more rigorous proof of those actions that, that you've taken to, to meet your commitments. What are some of the steps that companies can take to put a bit more rigor around their data? And, and Kate, I think I'll go to you first. Sure. I think this might highlight a little bit of the difference between a professional services firm and, and a firm like Brian's. Um, you know, our our environmental footprint data is is much more limited. Um, our made our primary sources of emissions are electricity and business travel, so it's a little bit more simple. So we do use external third party verification where we can. For example, we do use a third party verifying. Um, agent on our carbon emissions that we, that we report. We also use Mercer to verify, um, to conduct a pay equity study for us annually. And so to the extent we're able, we do get third-party verification on, on disclosure items. And then for things that we're disclosing that are um, more internal, we are treating it like an SEC document. As Brian said, we're putting together a file with an audit trail for every number that's in there mm -hmm. um, and, and just keeping keeping backup information on everything that we have. Wow. 
Mark, anything to add to that? Yeah, what I would add is, is that this is where um, the audit committee is starting to ask more questions uh, around this, trying to make sure that companies are doing the things that Kate and Brian are talking about. Um, I will also say that this is a, a good spot, and, and um, I think both Brian and Kate talked about this, is, is where you might leverage your finance function. Um, uh, you know, Brian talked about internal audit. Who better than the finance function, even though they're not um, subject matter experts, to understand how to find data, collect data, process data, control data, uh, and build a cadence for reporting data at scale um, in, a, in a reasonable time period. And so, um, you know, I've been surprised um, at how slowly finance functions over the years have, have been around um, thinking about this information or thinking that it was in their scope to, to be um, uh, considering what to do around this. But that's frankly, because it wasn't at all anywhere near the 10K filings. Mm -hmm. But now, irrespective of the geography of the disclosure, I think we're seeing, I'm seeing that, that more and more finance organizations are getting involved with, with at least utilizing their skill set, their unique skill set in, mm -hmm. in doing this kind of information around controls and, and processes um, to, to help out the subject matter experts who are building the sustainability report. Yeah, and I think those controls are probably very important in terms of making sure that it's done the same way each time or that you keep improving, you know, continuous improvement in the controls that you have around this information. So uh, comparability of information across companies as we've talked about and now even across jurisdictions uh, can be a challenge for stakeholders and I suspect for companies as well. And Kate mentioned that, that Marsh uses different frameworks and it's reported, but having a globally accepted system built from existing standards and frameworks could help support companies in presenting their ESG information so that it's comparable. And you know, those frameworks could be uh, adapted to address market needs in, in different jurisdictions. Kate, what about the consolidation or harmonization among the frameworks? Like where are we headed? Do you know? I mean, and how will your company respond? Um, well, I would I would say from a company perspective, it certainly would make our lives easier. Um, knowing what's expected uh, and, and being able to benchmark ourselves. Um, maybe I'll leave the crystal ball to, to Mark to, to guess where that's going to go. But I would say, you know, if I were giving advice to other companies, I would say do your gap analysis today. Look at the reporting frameworks that are out there. Look at what you have, what you don't have, what you want to have. Um, do that gap analysis today so that when when and if these these frameworks do start to align, um, you'll be you'll be ready for it from a reporting perspective. Mark, what's your crystal ball? Yeah. <laughs> is this where I put in the disclaimer that this is Mark Siegel's view and not my organization's view? Yeah. Um, there there are organizations. So so SASB and IARC have announced an intention to merge. Um, so you're starting to see a little bit of the consolidation um, that that you know you would hope for to potentially start playing out. Um, I don't know that you'll ever see full consolidation because of the different audiences that you're thinking about. So if you're thinking about an investor audience, it might make sense for all the investor focused um, groups to converge, but you still have potentially um, a, a broader stakeholder group that you're trying to communicate with. And that's a different um, set of content that you'd want to include in there. Um, you know, and then there's, there's whatever the SEC might do. Uh, you know, frankly, so there will be more consolidation. The five organizations are starting to move together and working together toward putting out prototypes of a climate-related disclosure that all five could sign off on, for example. Um, but irrespective of that, I think it's going to be important because ultimately one day some of this will be mandated. Um, and my guess is just like in financial reporting, companies won't like what gets mandated and won't think it's perfectly helpful in telling their story. So there will be mandated disclosures, and then there will be non-GAAP. Um, there will be other kinds of disclosures that will help companies tell their story. So there's no reason to wait on the latter um, to get started, uh, as, as, as both Kate and Brian have given great examples of today. So since you have your crystal ball out, um, I will ask, you mentioned that some things are starting to get mandated. Um, you know, what can we expect in the near future about in terms of like the regulatory or legislative inroads to ESG reporting? So in the US, I mean, the SEC has been extremely active in the last couple of months. Um, and I guess most importantly, there's a there's a request for comment um, that is open for um, open for for people to give comments on today. Um, for the next, uh, you know, for the next uh, almost 75 days, you can give comments to the SEC on what you think 
uh, they should do around disclosure. But the, the SEC has made it clear in the last couple of months that they are intending to look at potential rulemaking um, you know, uh, around ESG disclosure that could take many different forms. Human capital was, was, was done last year. Um, it could take a principles-based format like they did with human capital. It could take a more prescriptive guidance um, like they've done in other, other spots with, uh, you know, with financial type of disclosures or market risk disclosures. Um, or they could point out a standard setter and, and potentially say, follow that one. I don't know which one they're going to do, but they have given every intention that they are considering rulemaking later this year. Great. Okay, so we only have a couple minutes left. And what I'd love to do is get each of you to um, share with our audience what you would think are your one or two key takeaways uh, on this whole subject and, and the role of uh, compliance function in ESG reporting. So Brian, I'm gonna start with you as the Chief Sustainability Officer. Right. Well, I think I think we've touched on this various different ways throughout the, the discussion. I, I think being reactive in a disclosure setting is a very dangerous position to be in. So to the extent you're not already disclosing voluntarily now, I, I would encourage you to start because this is this is the time, like we've talked about it, this is the time when when you start, you can disclose what you want, you can you can learn the ins and outs. You can learn about the ripple effects of different types of, of disclosures and really try to become more proactive, you know, looking down the line to what Kate said, you know, what are we going to do next year? How are we going to prepare to disclose that next year and being ready for that? I think moving from reactive to becoming proactive in disclosures is super important. And I think finally, there's a lot of time and there's a lot of resources invested in ESG disclosures. And it would be a shame if you didn't maximize the value of that time and the resources to, to use your, your disclosures to drive change. Don't report out just to report out. Use the feedback and, and the, the, the scores that you get and the, and the gaps that, that are presented back to you. Use those to drive change in your organization. Become more sustainable and a better company for it. Those are kind of the takeaways I would give. Sure. Um, I agree with everything Brian said, and I think I'll add that since this is an Ethisphere conference, um, you know, we've talked a lot about metrics and frameworks and controls here, but really at the end of the day, these issues, you know, ESG issues are at the heart of every company's purpose and culture. And I think compliance officers as culture ambassadors need to take this opportunity to learn these issues um, and, and really advocate for change within the organization and, or, and advocate for organizations to be focused on this um, before, before these disclosures become mandatory. And last but not least, Mark, a few takeaways. Sure. Just to amplify um, the great points that both Brian and Kate made, um, you know, I think it's really, really important to, to try to understand how to tell your story is by making sure you understand the integration of ESG issues with your business issues. Um, you know, reporting on ESG issues for the sake of reporting on ESG issues is not going to be really, really helpful and is probably not going to be very time efficient. So, so understanding which of these ESG issues are most important toward progressing toward your business's goals um, is extremely important um, and will, will, will frankly help the entirety of the organization, not just in ESG reporting, but overall. Uh, and then the other takeaway that I have is, is don't wait, get started, leverage the finance function, um, uh, to, to, to help you build that, that, that infrastructure to, to do this over time proactively. Great, thank you. So thank you panelists. This was, I think, a really great and informative discussion. And thank you to the audience for listening in.